Well, thanks. Uh, I'll talk about my squid wounds later with you in private. Um, a polar bear with her cubs on a chunk of melting ice is a pretty iconic image of climate change. But I'd like to tell you today about climate change that's happening deep in the ocean under the ice, where oxygen is decreasing. Um, so this decrease in oxygen as, a, as an element of climate change is going to affect a lot of top marine predators um, that breathe oxygen but get it out of the water and don't come to the air to breathe it. Uh, this includes most of the fish we eat as seafood, um, and it also, of course, includes my favorite animal, the jumbo squid, or the Humboldt squid. Uh, this creature is um, a large predator, and it's kind of uh, weirdly charismatic in its own way. They change color by, uh, and they communicate by changing color. So it's a fascinating creature. Um, but what's important today is what squ this squid and probably others can teach us about how to succeed in climate change. So if you were taking a walk on the beach on Christmas Eve this year, this is what you'd have seen at Abtos in Monterey Bay. Hundreds of dead squid on the beach. Um, they don't bring out the same empathy as polar bears maybe, but it's sad. Um, anyway, th this is weird behavior. The squid weren't dead when they washed in. They actively swim onto the beach and beach themselves. Um, uh, we don't know why they do that. It seems that uh, it's not a good idea if you're a squid, but it does fit in with their lifestyle that I'll tell you about. Um, the squid had disappeared from Monterey Bay in 2010 after an El Nino event. These are their offspring coming back for the first time after two years. So they were invading in this place for the first time, and this beaching is something squids seem to do when they invade a new place. Uh, their kind of algorithm is to swim around the ocean searching for food um, pushing the boundaries, and sometimes that takes you on the beach. Um, maybe they're kind of like the wild pigs of the ocean or something. Um, the Humboldt squid, also called the jumbo squid, not colossal or giant, merely jumbo, um, came to Monterey Bay in 2002. Uh, they hadn't been there before. Uh, the closest place that had a large population of squid at that time was Mexico's Gulf of California or the Sea of Cortez. Uh, this is a tropical place, really, that has water time temperatures in the summer that are close to your body temperature, and in the winter can be about the same as California. So it's a huge temperature range. The squid are there year-round. They clearly can tolerate this. So they're, they're tolerant of these environmental differences. Um, it's, fr it's from this region that we think the squid, came to, came, the squid in Monterey Bay came from. Uh, from 2002 to 2005, the squid moved northward along the Pacific coast, past Oregon, past Washington, past British Columbia, to as far north as the southeast Alaska. This is the high water mark of their invasion. Uh, the water in this place is colder than the inside of your refrigerator. So that's a huge difference from the Sea of Cortez in the summer. It's about a 30 degree centigrade difference. I don't know of any large migratory predatory fish that can tolerate uh, a temperature range like this. So hum Humboldt squid are pretty unique. Um, they retreated from Alaska, that might have been pushing the envelope a little too far, back to British Columbia where they provided feasts for bears and wolves for a few years as the squid continued to strand as they came into new areas. Uh, so we have a weird case of a marine predator affecting terrestrial ecology. Of course, these are large marine predators, so they also affect marine ecology, uh, which is a lot of what we study about them. So, like good predators, squid eat local. They take advantage of their local abundance. Uh, in the Gulf of California, uh, this dotted black circle, very small, uh, the squid eat mostly midwater organisms that are, that are quite small. Uh, lumin luminous lanternfish, uh, pelagic crabs, swimming crabs, uh, little midwater squids and krill. Uh, you could hold a whole collection of these animals in the palm of your hand. They're really small. If you go to the Pacific coast on the Baja Peninsula, the green circle, uh, squid start adding some fish to the diet. Um, and as you go north into California, they had several dozen species of fish, some of which we're quite familiar with, and some of which are commercially important. The fish also get a lot larger. So this Pacific hake uh, is as long as my forearm. Uh, it's food for squid. Uh, as squid go further north still into the Pacific Northwest, they start eating four species of salmon smolts. Um, needless to say, people worry about things like this, especially if you're a commercial fisherman. 
Now, the important thing ecologically is that the squid always eats these small midwater organisms. We call them mesopelagic micronecton. That's your word for the day. It means <laughs> small things that swim at great depth. Um, but I love the sound of it. Um, anyway, they eat this same micronecton everywhere. It's all over the oceans. It's really abundant. Uh, and as they go into a new area, they uh, take advantage of local abundance of these larger fish. As, as if you went to the lunch out there, where did you go? For the sandwiches or for celery sticks? So uh, it's a good strategy. Uh, eat, eat the good stuff first. Uh, and they're good, good at that. So uh, they're also really good at growing fast and making lots of offspring. So this large squid uh, opened up uh, is about a year old. It started as a one millimeter baby. Uh, it grows to be as much as 140 pounds in less than two years. This one weighs about 35 pounds. Um, and uh, that's equivalent to a human being growing to be the size, uh, several size, several times bigger than a blue whale in a year. So this is really rapid growth. Um, this adult female here that's opened up has all these orange eggs. There's about 20 million of them there. And those squid that are uh, the eggs deposited in the ocean, the squid will hatch out in three or four days. It's very fast. And they become food for basically everything in the ocean. All the fish, all the seabirds, you name it, eats baby squid. So squid are really important uh, ecologically as both predator and prey throughout their entire life, no matter what size they attain. Um, speaking of size, this little squid in the left-hand corner is especially interesting. It was caught at the same place in the Gulf of California as the large one, same time. It's the same species. It's genetically identical as far as we can tell, but it um, is also fully mature. So um, this is only less than six months old, very few eggs compared to the big squid. What's going on? Well, this is a way that squid uh, cope with El Nino. They, when El Nino comes, uh, food can be scarce, so you basically transform yourself into a tiny squid that reproduces fast, matures precociously, takes on a totally different lifestyle, and turns the population over really rapidly. So it's an amazing uh, adaptation of life history strategy. So these, uh, this ba these banner points uh, on, the, on the bottom of the slide uh, are a suite of characteristics that the squid can use to cope with climate change. Basically, it swims around in the ocean uh, looking for food, capitalizing on change, uh, especially things that are disadvantaged by change. It's, um, you might consider it the natural history version of Bain Capital. Um, so what's really driving this expansion and movement of squid? What element of climate change are we really talking about? Well, let's go back to what the squid eat again. It's always about food with squid. So what you're looking at here is a, is a layer of lanternfish, uh, maybe two or 300 meters deep in the daytime, in the dark where they're safe from visual predators. Uh, all those green spots are luminous organs. Every spot is a fish. It, it's an, it's, it would be like looking out here and seeing all you in this layer. It's an amazingly dense assemblage of life at this midwater, uh, and it's also low oxygen here zone. Um, what are squid doing here? Well, they're eating. So this is a squid eating krill in a similar layer in Monterey Bay. The oxygen here is 20% of what it is at the surface. That's about the same at, as at 40,000 feet, and you would have about 15 seconds of consciousness under those conditions. Uh, but the squid's doing fine. Here's one feeding, hunting at a, a mile under sea in the Sea of Cortez, very cold. Um, oxygen's less than 10 to 10% saturation at the surface. Um, that 10% level is actually important because it's where oceanographers define the beginning of a zone called the oxygen minimum zone. If oxygen is lower than that, you need really special biochemical adaptations to survive. This is a map that shows the range expansion of Humboldt squid over the last 50 years, but it could also be a map showing changes in the oxygen minimum zone because oxygen is decreasing and this zone is expanding. The, Dotted blue lines are actually published oxygen data that shows the largest area of oxygen decline uh, during the same period. Um, and by decline, I mean about 50% at these depths. This is oxygen at 200 meters. So if it goes down 50%, there's almost no oxygen left. It's a, it's a big deal for animals that live at these depths. But it's no accident that the uh, areas of oxygen dec decline correspond so well with the Humboldt squid expansion. Uh, we think this squid is following this environmental feature as oxygen minimum zones expand um, because it's associated with food. 
So if we look at another way at these oxygen minimum zones, this is a sonar snapshot about 10 minutes long of a series of images from the Gulf of California taken under a ship. Sonar is like a giant ultrasound, so that's all you really have to know about it. But you can see a sperm whale diving down into a layer of krill at 150 meters. There's also pink squid embedded in that krill. This is a cartoon rendition of actual data. Um, down at 250 meters, you can see a layer of lanternfish, and there's squid in there. They're, all these predators are eating. The squid are eating the lanternfish and the krill. The sperm whale is eating the squid. It's a very uh, rich feeding ground for lots of predators. Why are these layers there? Well, if you measure the oxygen in this area, which we did, you'd see that uh, the 10% oxygen boundary of the oxygen minimum zone is right at the layer of lanternfish. They plaster up against that in the daytime, trying to get in the dark to protect themselves from predators, but not suffocate. If you look at the uh, 25% oxygen boundary, that's where the krill is. Around 25% is a level of oxygen that gets really stressful for most fish. So this layer between 25% and 10% oxygen is what we call the oxygen limited zone. It's a great hunting place, but most predators can't deal with it for very long. Squid are adapted to stay there all day and can feed 24-7 if they really want to. It's a great system. Uh, so what happens as oxygen decreases in the oxygen minimum zone? Well, this 10% oxygen zone gets pushed to the surface. It, it expands. The surface is always 100% oxygen, so that's important to remember. Uh, the OMZ expansion also causes the 25% boundary to lift toward the surface, which will compress this ecologically important oxygen-limited zone. The surface zone, the epipelagic zone, will also get compressed. So what you end up with is a situation with overcrowded large predators in a thin surface layer uh, where it's probably easy for them to catch each other and eat each other, also maybe easier for commercial fishermen to catch the survivors. Um, and the layers of food in the, these uh, scattering layers uh, are compressed more and more and compacted. Well, since the squid are favored in that zone over other predators, they're going to do well. Um, it's still an oxygen-limited habitat, so they're favored. Um, now, another important thing is, is that as these, as these layers move toward the surface, light penetrates into the ocean only so deep. So at some point, this oxygen-limited zone and the photic zone, the sunlit zone, are going to coalesce. And that's shown by this cartoon. So here, uh, all these organisms in the oxygen-limited zone will be experiencing more light, and predators can see them better, so they're more susceptible to predation. Again, since the Humboldt squid's favored in this zone, and it's a visual predator, it's going to do really well compared to its competitors. So, uh, and this is happening right now off California. This isn't a, a doomsday scenario or something I'm making up. This, this is real. It's happening right now. Um, so this is the squid's five-point plan for survival strategy. Uh, evolution has selected for these traits in the Humboldt squid and uh, possibly produced uh, the perfect uh, design you can imagine for coping with climate change. It's like a swimming shark in the air. It, it's got everything perfect. Um, it's a very different scene than the uh, one that the uh, polar bears are caught in, which basically is the uh, truism that over-extinction is going to be a ticket to, or over-specialization is going to be a ticket to extinction if your environment changes too rapidly. Um, so, in conclusion, I guess I'd like to predict that we'll be seeing more squid in the future, uh, probably more on our dinner plates, and certainly more as cuddly uh, soft toys for, our, for the children of the future, uh, because polar bears may just get hard to find. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>